The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. K.T. Waxman, and I will be co-presenting this webinar today with Marjorie Miller. I am currently the director of the Master's in Healthcare Simulation Program at the University of San Francisco, and Marjorie is adjunct faculty and lead faculty for the California Simulation Alliance at University of San Francisco. And we are excited to be here today to talk about faculty development for simulation programs. I'm going to go over some of the objectives, we're going to go through some content, and then at the end we're going to talk about our Masters of Healthcare Simulation program. We hope to list the basic foundations of curriculum design and assessment strategies for simulation and healthcare curricula, discuss the importance of providing ongoing education for simulation faculty, articulate educational frameworks used in simulation education, and talk a little bit about the certification process, the certified healthcare simulation educator, also known as the CHEESY. So this webinar will provide the participants with the basic foundation of curriculum design and assessment strategies for simulation and healthcare curricula, an overview of faculty development models, courses, and the evidence to support faculty development will be discussed. So what is simulation and why do we use it in healthcare? I mean, many of you know that simulation has been around for a long time. Um, simply f using an orange to demonstrate and assist students in um, giving an injection is, is a form of simulation. Um, role playing without touching patients is a form of simulation. And it has been around for very many years in the aviation industry. As we know, we would never assume that a pilot would fly a plane without going through a simulated exercise. And when Sully Sullenberger landed the plane in the Hudson River, I guarantee you he'd never landed a plane in a river before, but he had gone through landing in unusual places many, many times in the simulator. So it is defined through the Sim Society for Simulation and Healthcare as the imitation or representation of one act or symptom system by another. And that is just a very overview of what simulation is. The purpose, according to the Society for Simulation and Healthcare, there are four. Education is the first, assessment, second, research, the third, and healthcare systems integration is the fourth. So this is why we use simulation in healthcare. There are many, many types of simulation. I mentioned the orange as the first. Um, computer-based simulations where you can actually um, coordinate around a, a system on uh, a different platform with maybe using an avatar or having a cartoon character with a bubble come up with a question in it and you as the learner are having to do something with the mouse could be a form of computer-based uh, simulation. Um, high fidelity simulation is extremely popular in that these are very expensive, high-fidelity simulators that look like people from a child to a baby to a full-blown um, adult that can be switched to look like a male or a female that breathe, have bowel sounds, lung sounds, pulses, they can sweat, seize, etc. To low-fidelity, which could be a CPR mannequin, that um, is, is used very frequently for different scenarios when you don't really need that high fidelity um, simulator. So there's an opportunity for sim programs to have um, varying levels of fidelity and level of mannequin in their uh, programs. 
standardized participants, also known as standardized patients. These are real people that are hired uh, to come in and mimic signs and symptoms, and they're scripted to allow the students to do assessments, history and physicals, and sometimes exams on. And there's quite a movement in that area through evaluators and National Society of Standardized Patients as well. Hybrid is taking a, a high fidelity or a task trainer with a standardized participant and um, putting them together to simulate, for example, a birth. You could have a woman in labor with a task trainer delivering a baby. Um, so that would be considered hybrid. You could have a participant in an audience uh, mimic a heart attack and fall to the floor and then showcase the scenario up on a stage using a high fidelity mannequin. That would also be considered hybrid. Immersive is actually really putting people into a simulation and immersing them in an experience for them to experience it through adult learning principles. In situ is actually taking the simulator or the um, uh, most likely a, a high fidelity or a mid-level fidelity simulator into a patient care area, into the lobby of a hospital, into a parking lot, and doing a code or another scenario in, in that environment. Mobile simulation um, entails actually having a van or a car or a bus and putting simulators and people in that van and moving to different areas around the region to provide simulation experiences for those who may not a be able to attend um, in an urban area. And then virtual reality is we're seeing a lot with holograms and avatars and that. Um, so all of these things are actually types of simulation. Um, one thing that we like to reinforce in our program is that it really is not about the technology, even though I described several types of technology. It's really about the methodology and about the pedagogy, the andragogy of simulation. And that's what we're here to talk about today, is actually the faculty development piece. Buying a simulator and getting training from a vendor is not adequate. It's important, but it isn't all that one needs to be a successful simulation educator. So we really believe that faculty development is the key to success of a program. It's really critical for the success of a simulation program. It should be focused on the methodology grounded in adult learning theory. For accreditation and certification it is required. So if your Sim Center is moving towards accreditation through the Society of Simulation and Healthcare, they will require you to have a faculty development plan. They will require you to show evidence of completion of courses for your faculty. They will require you to show what your minimum standards and requirements are for simulation faculty to be able to teach in that environment. In terms of certification, to apply to be a certified healthcare simulation educator, which is also known as a cheesy is um, that you have to have two years experience in doing simulation, either ongoing simulation or teaching in simulation. And you have to show evidence that you've gone to ongoing faculty development programs, courses, conferences, etc. Faculty development ensures that faculty have the necessary skills to develop appropriate scenarios and teach in a simulated environment. Scenario development, which we actually talked about on our last webinar, is critical um, as well to the success of our program. And we will be talking about scenario development at another um, webinar, but having faculty understand that scenarios need to be evidence-based, they need to have clear goals and objectives, and they need to have a debriefing component is important. The other thing is that it needs to be budgeted for, and oftentimes this is overlooked when um, schools or hospitals are creating a simulation center or program, they budget for equipment, space, and staff, but that ongoing faculty development needs to be embedded in the budget as well. So I'm going to give you some examples of one faculty development program that has been successful in California. And it is built on the Benner's 
uh, Patricia Banner's Novice to Expert model. And it really brings a level, a level of experience on which to build and create a new mental model about simulation. As an expert, as a clinical or um, a theory faculty, for years um, of teaching, uh, you're considered an expert. When you come into simulation, you really become a novice again. And the folks that understand that moving into simulation, that they need to move through the novice to expert uh, framework, the bet more successful they are. So we, we really encourage and promote moving through a series of novice to advanced beginner, specialized courses, and then finally an apprenticeship, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, one example, and there are many other models out there in the country, but this is just one um, example that has been in existence since 2006. Um, it's, it's really about a level one to four uh, model with ultimately ending up as a train the trainer model. And so the first um, level is the novice level. And it's your basic training, and it also includes some of the technical components. However, since 2006, many strides have been made in uh, hiring of simulation technicians. Originally, back in 2006, it was really looked upon that faculty would need to be an expert in the simulator, run the sim scenario, write the scenario, troubleshoot the simulator. And what's happened over time is faculty are starting to really do what they know best, and that is to teach and facilitate the learning of the student or the, or the staff. And the technicians are actually doing the technical component. So basic level one is understanding, high level the technical component, and then understanding the basic um, educational frameworks around simulation and scenario development and debriefing. Moving into level two is a little bit more content on the advanced beginner and really being able to write and run your own scenarios. And we really believe, as Patricia Benner points out in her book, Novice to Expert, is that taking classes does not equal competence and, and proficiency. That you need to take a class, go back and practice, and then come back for further training. And so this model is built on a level one to four. And what we put in the level three are the specialty courses like leadership, simulation leadership, the technical training, the debriefing. We actually ta have talked about debriefing in level one and two, but number in level three is actually where we do a full day of debriefing training. Very discipline specific like OB or pediatric training. And then the encouraging people to go for an apprenticeship at um, a site for 72 to 80 hours, um, like a fellowship program, is also um, very, very highly recommended, ultimately resulting in proficiency and a train-the-trainer model where we can start training others. So in 06 to 09, the, the Bay Area Simulation Collaborative created this model and was focused on, on building um, competence. In 2010 to 2012, the California Simulation Alliance focused on really enhancing this competence through this level three training and building strength and a critical mass of educators around the state of California. And then in 2013 to 16, their focus has been on train the, training the trainer. And we now have approximately 20 trainers in the state of California and specific at University of San Francisco, who has adopted this model, we have created uh, standards and criteria for all of our simulation faculty. So anyone that teaches in simulation in our simulation center has to meet certain criteria in order for them to teach in that environment. And ultimately, that benefits the student and keeps everyone on the same page in a standardized fashion. Um, one thing that we're seeing a lot of is interprofessional simulations, and I have described, I haven't really said the word nurse uh, much, but interprofessional simulation is when you see a physician or medical student, a pharmacist, respiratory, PT, OT, speech, podiatry perhaps, social work, and nursing all coming together 
uh, to do a simulation and learn together. And so with faculty development, it isn't just designed for the nursing staff. It's for the sim tech to take them to the next level, to enable them uh, a career path, if you will, to become a manager, perhaps. And for the faculty, whether they're a nurse, pharmacist, or physician, just ongoing development to learn how to work in an interprofessional way. So those are just some, that's some of the background on some of the different um, models out there and how critical it is to really focus on Benner's novice to expert model, whether you have 30 years experience of it as an educator or zero. When you get into simulation, you become a novice. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Marjorie Miller, my colleague, who will talk about educational frameworks and why simulation works. We're going to unmute Marjorie. Let's see if we can do that. Marjorie, we need to unmute you. There you go. There. Okay, here I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks, KT. Um, I do not have access to forwarding my own slides, and so throughout the presentation, um, I will be asking KT to push to the next slide. So we need to ask ourselves the question, we know simulation works, but how does it work? Why does it work? And that's what the next two sections will be. So when we look at the educational frameworks, KT mentioned one already, and that was the novice to expert. So we'll be looking at that separately towards the end of, the, of um, this part of the presentation. But there are a, couple, a number of current theoretical frameworks that are based in current cognitive science that support the benefits of simulation-based learning. These four frameworks will be highlighted in the subsequent slides. The overarching framework is the theory of constructivism upon which the other frameworks are based. And as we describe these theories throughout, we'll discuss what it is, how learning occurs, excuse me, how learning occurs, and what instructor behaviors will facilitate that learning process. Next, KT. Okay. So what is constructivism? It's an active process of constructing meaning. It's how people make sense of their experience. Constructivists say that learning occurs when a situation will trigger a relevant part of a learner's frame of reference, or another term that we're using in simulation is their mental model that provokes the construction of a new and expanded mental model. That's what we're, get, that's what we're aiming for here. Um, helpful teacher behaviors that support that type of learning are to scaffold that learning by providing support such as resources. Um, excuse me, I lost my notes here. Um, let me go back. Okay, such as um, resources that are available. So sometimes what we'll do, we'll provide the little tips to students. So the little, uh, I can't remember what you call them, those little cards that give you like the Team Steps cards. What happens is as your learners go uh, further in their development, then what will happen is that they will be able to operate on their own, and then we can take some of those scaffolds away. New slide, KT. Okay, so the basic, um, the, the basic framework that we're looking at really has to do with um, the experiential learning, and all of these we can put into the same category. So you can see that when we look at the experiential learning uh, framework, then we look at um, Kolb first. So many of you are probably familiar with David Kolb, who started his um, original research in 1984. And essentially what Kolb says is that um, people go through, they have a particular learning style, and they go through a certain process. But for learning to occur, that learning needs to have there needs to be an experience, hence the term experiential learning. There's also a portion of time where an individual learns best by reflection, a reflective observation. They need to watch something, and some of you may be this type, but watch an experience before they get actively involved in it. 
Others will involve themselves in looking at something and then forming an abstract an abstraction about the process, and others are the search and discovery type learners who need to experiment. What Kolb says is that for any learning to occur, that one needs to have an experience, reflect on that experience, abstract the principles that are involved, and then go back and create and, and be active in the process of, of uh, solidifying that learning. So we can see that simulation does this right away. Simulation is an experience. We see learners, and we'll talk about it uh, further, reflect. We can see the wheels turning when they're in the process. We can see them thinking, trying to figure out what's going on. And then we can see them actually experimenting some more and changing their behaviors. So that's something that we look at. Another really old time um, uh, educator was, and uh, psychologist was Carl Rogers. And I found um, this to be very exciting when I was looking at some of the work that uh, he had done as it relates to simulation. His work was done really on um, in Freedom to Learn, which was the name of that book. But what he says is that there needs to be a positive environment. There needs the activity or the experience needs to have a clear purpose. How often do we hear students say, or in, especially in academia, what were we supposed to get out of that? And you think, oh my god. But anyway, that happens a lot. So the, the um, experience needs to have a clear purpose. There needs to be resources. So any of the pre-activity uh, reading or um, computer work that's done. There needs to be a balance between the cognitive and the emotional and the physical part of the activity. So it's not just theory. It's not just skills, but it's also the attitudes that go along. So this goes right along with the cues and competencies of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And the other thing that Roger says is that we as facilitators can share our own experience without taking over the whole process and without taking responsibility for the learning. That's something that's really tough for very expert educators to learn and to change. The third one that we will talk about is Benner. And we learned that um, uh, Benner developed the novice to expert model of the way people progress, the way nurses progress in their education. And she says that learning occurs when that learner is open to having their expectations refined, challenged, or even disconfirmed. And we see this happening frequently in simulation. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, the, one, the other process that we use is adult learning theory, which is also an experiential type learning theory. So in this situation, what we're essentially, oh, it looks like I've, um, okay. So in this situation, we know that adults will learn what they want to learn, when they want to learn it, in the way they want to learn it. So essentially, a nicer way of putting it is that adults are problem-centered rather than content-centered. So even though they want you to tell them everything, they act like they want you to tell them everything in class, that's not the way they learn best. They really are self-motivated and involved. They have previous mental models that they expect to have recognized and valued. And then it's essentially finding out where they are and then moving them to where they need to be. And the other thing about adults is that they, are, they have an intrinsic motivation, even though many times they'll say, well, how many points is this worth and what grade I'm going to get? Their intrinsic motivation is that they need to apply their learning to um, an actual work-related situation or um, some other um, related situation, but it has to have meaning for them. Again, it's problem-centered rather than content-centered. Let's move on, KT. Okay, when we look at reflective practice, this is another model that is very important and we, we highlighted it when we looked at um, reflective observation with David Cole. 
So we need we know that Schoen's theory of learning as a reflective practice is the basis of how professionals will think in action. And we can see this and we see our experts doing that too. So the cultivation of the capacity to reflect in action while doing something and then on action after you've done it, such as in debriefing, has become an important feature of professional training programs in many disciplines. And its encouragement is seen particularly an important aspect of simulation. In Benner's expert, uh, novice to expert model, she says that the, that the uh, expert clinician applies evidence-based practice at the bedside. Next, KT. Okay, so a couple of the other models that we're looking at are um, uh, the contextual model, which just means that you need to have an environment that's similar to the work environment, and situated cognition, where we have experiences where someone's going to be very aware, they're, they're designed so that the person can be very aware of the situation that they're in and develop those skills. And then novice to expert, and the last one we'll look at is deliberate practice. Next, Katie. Okay, when we look at um, Benner's novice to expert um, model, we see that she explains and expands the description of experiential learning when she describes it as clinical learning that is accomplished, as I said before, by having one's expectations refined, challenged, or even disconfirmed by the unfolding events. This process is how the novice, who is rule-driven and bound by concrete thinking, along, uh, moves along the continuum to the expert who is able to reflect in action or think on their feet to apply evidence-based practice at the bedside. Experiential learning is evident in every situation where preconceptions, again, are challenged clinical inquiry is demonstrated, and self-reflection is required. So it's essential that as simulation educators, we provide simulations that are challenging, but not overwhelming, and provide the resources with intentionality where, whereby the learners can demonstrate clinical inquiry, decision-making, and the ability to self-reflect without fear of humiliation after the simulation so that they can examine their own performance gaps and improve. Next, KT. Okay, so how did it work? This is the mystery of the assessment. The, in this next, oh, probably, I don't know, eight or nine slides, we're just going to talk a little bit and skim the surface, surface of assessments. Next. Okay, some of you may be familiar with Kirk, Kirkpatrick's um, evaluation model. And in this term right here, we're going to be using evaluation and assessment interchangeably. So we look at four different types. So the level one type evaluation is what we in the trade call the smile sheet. And that's essentially a reaction to the experience. And this is the type of simulation usually, I'm sorry, the type of an evaluation tool usually based on a Likert scale that we use frequently. There's this, another type of an evaluation, um, another phase at level two, where we ask specific questions to evaluate the learning that took place. And um, this is done in a different kind of a model. And some of the examples that are on the Team Steps um, website, AHRQ website, are examples of this. And the same with level three. In level three, we're also looking not only at the learning, but also at the behavior. And the level three eva evaluation tool is a little bit different than that. And then the level four is what we're going to be doing after we've had the training, and that essentially is what results did we achieve? Did we achieve the results that we aim to do? Next slide. Now this slide is a um, pretty busy slide right now, but what it does is it takes two frameworks that are pretty frequently used. Uh, excuse me, I've, I don't have enough room on my screen to be able to see what's going on. But we're looking at Miller's assessment and Bloom's taxonomy, and I forgot to indicate that this is the revised taxonomy. 
So essentially what we're looking at is what are the assessment tools that are useful at, at different levels. So knowledge-based test will look at, well let me back up for a minute. So Miller's assessment, if, um, if you're not familiar with it, really breaks learning into um, uh, four parts. So a person knows first, and this is what we handle in theory, they know how, and this is what we handle in a skills lab or with a skills module. We show how, and this is what happens in some kind of a uh, performance-based test in the clinical area or in a skills lab. And then they do, they apply it into action. And that's what we're looking for um, in uh, Miller's assessment. Bloom's taxonomy is the revised taxonomy has moved evaluation from the top level to one down and included create at the top. So essentially we know that knowledge-based, um, hold on just one second. Okay, um, I just had to plug in. Um, we know that when we're looking at remember or understand, we're looking at the ability of the individual and our content to know. So these are usually knowledge-based paper and pencil or computerized test. The application and the analysis is going to be the clinical-based test. Um, application, if it's a skill, and the analysis will also be performance-based tests. So these two are frequently used together. The, another performance-based test can be the evaluation and then essentially going out and applying it into the clinical area and creating new frameworks, new uh, policies and procedures will be um, the top level in this, um, in this model. Uh, next, KT. So the next method, the next thing that we're going to look at in the next couple of slides are choosing the appropriate assessment method. Most of us have found that um, what we're doing is actually just the first level assessment. And so we need to look at this a little bit more appropriately. The things, I'm just going to enter into a couple of questions for you. The things that we're going to be looking, questions we're going to be looking at are, is it valid? Is the assessment method that I'm choosing valid for the experience and for the curriculum that I'm teaching? Is it reliable? And is it feasible? So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so are we measuring what we're supposed to be measuring? Is, an, is it an appropriate instrument for the knowledge, the skills, or the attitudes, and these are a little tough sometimes, that you're testing? within the context that it's being used. So that's very important. You can pull a tool, and I'll give you a, um, a site, and an article that you can use and pull a tool from uh, clinical simulation and nursing, but you need to make sure that it is going to be appropriate within the context that you are using it. Next slide, KT. Okay, so the use of validated tools. This is a comment that came in one of the articles, and I, I can't read the whole thing because I can't see the slide off to the right, but it's what they're essentially talking about is that it's rarely appropriate to um, justify the use of a particular scoring tool slowly on previous validation studies. You need to make sure that your tool is appropriate for your learner group. Next slide. Okay, so some of the questions that we're going to be looking at with this is that you one needs to consider when you're choosing a tool the purpose of the assessment, the administration conditions, and the evidence that supports the tools. So we'll go a little bit further into that. Next slide, KT. Okay, and the next ass assessment is the reliability. And this is just, again, skimming the surface, but does it consistently measure what it's supposed to be measuring. And so the types of reliability that we know that are being used are the interrelator, excuse me, interrater, which is, are, 
does one raider assess it consistently the way another raider uses it? So that's something very important. And then is it consistent over time? So it's test and retest. Next slide, Katie. Okay, and the next assessment is something that people forget a lot, and that is whether the feasibility. Is the administration of the assessment instrument feasible in terms of time and resources? And we frequently completely forget that part. Next slide, Katie. Okay, so the things that you would want to consider when you're considering whether this is feasible for you is how much time does it take to construct it and score it? How easy is it to interpret the score that produces the results? How many people? What's the time available? How, num how many staff are required to facilitate it? And how many, what's the number of staff required to perform the assessment? And then looking at the resources and equipment available. So it's not as simple as just going to, next slide, KT going to this article by Adamson, Cardon, Engren, and Wilhouse, which is an updated review of the currently published evaluation instruments for human patient simulation. This um, article was uh, published in 2013, and you have the citation there. This is um, an, an updated one to the one that was published in 2010. There's, this is one situation where we really um, attempt to not reinvent the wheel, to take and study some of the evaluation tools that are available and then um, adapt it for your own needs. And um, they're very, very interested in what your feedback is in this area. So that's a very quick review of some of the um, educational frameworks and assessment tools. And now I'm going back to KT. You can mute me now. Okay. Thank you, Marjorie. You're welcome. So how can we justify faculty development? It's always nice to have, but we want to make sure that we have evidence to support that it's important. There was a recent study from the National Council on State Boards of Nursing, also known as the NCSBN research study that came out this um, past September. And 10 schools around the country participated in this study. During the first year of uh, their clinical hours training in their program, they used 10% of their clinical time in simulation, their second 25%, and their third 50%. What they found was, and this is a very long um, study, and it's downloadable off of the uh, Anaxel website, or you could just Google NCSBN research study and download that PDF as well. So their outcomes showed that there was no difference in the NCLEX scores, which is the uh, licensing exam that nurses take at the end of their uh, school schooling to become registered or licensed. There was no difference in NCLEX scores with 50% simulation versus 100% in the clinical arena. And what they also found was that for every two hours that we were counting as cl clinical experience where the students are in the hospital learning, uh, you could do two hours of clinical in one hour of simulation in a simulation center because you can guarantee a clinical experience. And so what they also found was that the faculty that were teaching in these simulation programs needed to have ongoing education. And it's in black and white. The evidence shows that faculty development is essential. So is simulation here to stay, and where is the evidence? That study showed that there were no difference in outcomes, that NCLEX scores were the same, and that faculty development is critical. So we've got it right there in writing, and we can, we can use that as we're negotiating for resources to keep our faculty up to date and current. And studies have also shown that when you use simulation, to work on sepsis rates or transfers to decrease transfers to the ICU um, or increase teamwork that the, the studies have shown that simulation has been effective. And the only way that it can be effective is if you have quality faculty or nurse educators um, 
running those simulations. So to build a case for faculty development, we really believe that there is evidence to support faculty development. We also believe that it needs to be built into the budget. And when you're building a budget to buy a simulator or to get space or to integrate it into your curriculum or to do mock codes, whatever the case may be, you also need to build into the budget the case, the dollars for faculty development. Three course, three courses or conferences per year per faculty equals X amount of dollars. And being able to justify that by saying the evidence is there to support it and with ongoing faculty development, you'll be getting a return on investment because our sepsis rates will go down, our transfers will go down, etc. Consider a train and trainer model. It's always good to have uh, super users or super experts, trainers in your organization to train others. And those, you could um, send those, those individuals to uh, be trained as experts and they, they can come back and train others. You need to budget for attendance at simulation conferences and we have the International Meeting on Simulation and Healthcare in January 2016 in San Diego. We have the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning annual conference in Texas in June. So those are two to look for and to budget for. Faculty development enables faculty to sit for this national certification, which increases your credibility as an organization and as a professional. It also increases job satisfaction and retention. A recent study that we conducted in California showed that the the faculty that attended our advanced simulation intensive training had more uh, job satisfaction when they got back to their office because they had a newfound knowledge and felt more confident and their simulations had higher quality. And rapid advanced simulation require ongoing education. There's so much cha changing that being trained in 2010 one time in one class doesn't mean that you're going to be uh, competent in 2015. Some of the trends that we're seeing in simulation internationally are the increase in interprofessional education and having students that are in allied health professions with um, nursing and medicine training together and then interprofessional education in the hospitals and health systems rather than siloing the way we, we educate. Increasing the use of standardized participants, you're going to see a lot more of that. Um, leveling of technology where it's not really all about this $100,000 simulator. It's about the methodology of simulation and identifying what type of, of technology you need to meet your learning objectives. And it may just be an office with a standardized participant or an actor. Systems integration, a lot of hospitals and health systems are using simulation um, to identify gaps in their processes. They're doing root cause analysis, analyses, risk, risk um, type of simulations, delivering bad news, uh, flow of the patient from the admission uh, office to the ICU. Uh, sim labs are now, um, our mobile simulation is also very big. I talked about that earlier. And the sim lab or the sim center is now being identified as a clinical site. So when hot schools are looking for a clinical site, they can actually request a, an experience in a sim center rather than on a nursing unit. And then we talked about the increased certification and accreditation. Accreditation is really for your sim center, having policies and procedures in place and standardizing the way that you operate in your sim center and you can apply for accreditation, which is similar to a joint commission accreditation, but it's specifically for the SIM Center. Some of the resources that Marjorie and I like um, to utilize are the Society for Simulation and Healthcare, and that's ssih.org. INACSL is INA, let's see, INACSL.org, National League for Nursing, Quality and Safety Education for Nursing, CUSIN, and the California Simulation Alliance.org are some resources for you. So in terms of careers and simulation, just sort of segueing to our um, description of our program, we really believe that there is a uh, movement towards multiple careers in simulation. It could be a faculty or an educator. 
You could be a stimulation technician. You could be a coordinator, manager, director, or researcher. It's endless opportunities in simulation. So our program at University of San Francisco uh, School of Nursing and Health Professions is a non-clinical master's degree. And what that means is that if you have a bachelor's degree with a 3.0 GPA in any, t any field, you can apply for this master's. You could be a nurse, you could be a doctor, or you could be a biology major or a business major. It's a 30-unit uh, program, which includes 540 hours of practicum, and that practicum is field work that is done in a simulation center near your home or in San Francisco. And we have relationships with sim centers all over the world. It's an online program. I would say 95% online. And each semester, we come to San Francisco once for two days on campus to do a synthesis of what we've learned throughout the semester. So it's toward the end of the semester. And we have a guest speaker attend. And it's really good to network with your colleagues that you've been talking to online. It's highly recommended, but it is not required because we are considered an online program. So if you would like to attend but cannot physically be here, we will have opportunity for you to zoom in um, via the internet and participate. We prepare students to become professional simulationists in various um, areas. And as I said, a bachelor's degree is required. You don't have to have any experience. And our next group begins in January of 2016. And we are accepting applications now to start in January. And classes start January 25th. So in summary, just want to say thank you for listening to us. Uh, on this webinar, we have a series of uh, five or six webinars, and this is our second. And they're given once a month, so you can learn a little bit about simulation while you're deciding whether this is a good career for you, career, career choice. We're very excited of uh, the online component of our, of our courses, and we will probably be engaging um, very experienced simulation faculty from all over the country that will teach in the program. So I'd like to open it up for any questions um, and ask Jen if any questions have come through while we've been speaking. If not, we can wrap up. So far, no questions have come in, KT. OK, well, we'll just give it a few seconds to see if anyone has a question that they can just put in their chat. Um, and we can try to answer that. If not, we will thank you for your time. And Marjorie and, and my email are on the screen right now. And please feel free to email either of us with any questions about the program or about faculty development. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And we hope to see your application soon. Bye now.